the word divorce to me has a tremendous amount of energy in it. It is negative. It's conflictual. It's painful. When I hear it in my office as a marital therapist, as a couples therapist, it's like a bomb goes off in the room. The word divorce. To you out there listening, if you've been through a divorce, if, you've, if your parents have been through a divorce, you know how laden that word is with difficulty and with agony and pain and suffering and sadness. For some of you, very few of you, it doesn't have that association, but I would say for the most of you, it does. And I was thinking about that today, and I thought, why is that exactly? I mean, in our culture, we all know that a good percentage of marriages end in divorce, and yet for some reason, we have this super antiquated culture regarding divorce, and we also don't provide a guide for people with divorce. I mean, most people, they get lawyered up and they, they start attacking each other and it's this horrible experience for everyone. And, you know, $100,000 later, you didn't get anywhere and, and you hate each other at the end. And, and it just seems like we should be more evolved in 2015. Well, to provide that guidance, I thought I would have a guest come on the show, Joseph Schaub. He's been on the podcast before. His podcast on Duty to Warn is a very popular podcast episode. He's both a lawyer and a marriage and family therapist, and an old friend of mine. He taught me in my master's program 20 years ago, and he's also a friend of mine. So welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you very much, Kirk. So uh, you just published a book, not, what, two months ago? Yeah, two months. Called Divorce or Not, A Guide. And the longer title here is Healing Your Relationships with Emotionally Focused Therapy and Divorcing Well with Collaborative Law. We also had an episode on collaborative law that you were on the podcast for, Joe. When I heard that you had published this book, I instantly bought it on Amazon, which you can do, again, Divorce or Not, A Guide by Joseph Schaub. And it's a thick book, and it's a guide for lay people, correct? Yes, it is. It's not that thick. <laughs> it's, uh, it's on the thick side, yeah, I would say. It's not know. on the thin. It's not thin. It's got big print, though. It's not thin. It's 300 pages. Big print, yeah. Easy to read. I've already read half of it, I would say. And clinicians can also read it to help them as well, obviously. There's a lot of good information in here for that. Yeah, I think that... Um, there's stuff in it on the, you know, why relationships can be uh, salvaged portion of the book that I think lawyers would find helpful and interesting. And there's definitely stuff in the divorce part of the book that I think uh, mental health professionals would find informative and valuable. Yeah. This is the podcast called Psychology in Seattle. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am a therapist, and I'm also chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle. Please go to our Patreon page and become a patron of the podcast where you can get swag and exclusive content and other great things. Also, if you become a patron of the podcast, you know that 20% of your pledge each month, each month goes to the Trevor Project, which helps to prevent suicide among LGBTQ youth, and uh, also goes to another organization called the Plymouth Housing Group, which provides permanent supportive homes to homeless people. So... What can you tell us about this book and what inspired you to write it? I know that you've had a long career working with people and divorce and the law and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. What inspired you to write this book? The first thing that really drew me to wanting to write the book was that, oh gosh, you know, divorce the way it's conventionally done, the way you described it at the very beginning here tonight is so unnecessarily painful for people. And I mean, I've been in the legal world for, gosh, over 40 years now. And, um, you know, I think that the legal, uh, well, as the court system and the way the legal world deals with uh, resolving disputes between people, 
may be just fine if you are convicted, you know, if you're uh, accused of a crime. It may be just fine if you've got a, you know, if you're Microsoft and you want to stop someone from using, you know, your intellectual property. But it is insane in most cases to go through divorce and try to resolve those problems through the court system. It is set up to, um, to be, uh, to be painful to be people, to have to be adversarial, and it's uh, and so I really wanted to talk about that. And when I give talks to therapists about divorce, I talk a lot about the seven cardinal rules of legal divorce. And you know, there's a lot of different kinds of divorce. There's a psychological divorce. There's you know what people go through moving up to the point that they decide they can't be married anymore. There's a lot, you know, there's the social divorce, you know, how do you present yourself to your community as a single person where you were a couple, all kinds of things around that. And then there's the legal divorce and the legal divorce really focuses on certain specific things like parent, how, you know, how you arrange parenting and what you do with assets and liabilities and, and, and support. It's done in such a difficult way for people, and there and I came up with really seven cardinal rules about what you need to know. Like one of them uh, is uh, lawyers are trained to make a bad situation worse, and in fact, I want to read from that in a little while. Um, another one is you know judges do not dispense justice, uh, and they're good people, but that's just not what the system provides anymore. Uh, lots of things like that. So. That was the first thing I wanted to really press. And then as I, as I went into it, as I have gotten more deeply into my uh, couples therapy work, um, you know, I was first introduced to a lot of couples therapy through uh, John Gottman. And when I heard John Gottman speak down in Portland about 10 years ago, the thing that really impressed me about the guy was that he was promoting a, a, a form of working with couples that really addressed the problems of couples on the brink, people who were really having a hard time. In fact, he has so many great factoids. I love his factoids. And one of them is that, you know, when a couple comes in to see a therapist, on average, they've been having serious problems for six years. So when we see people uh, as, as marital therapists and couples therapists, we're very seldom going to get people in there saying, well, we, you know, we, uh, we were doing fine, except we need a little help with communication. Usually people are just really fried and they're at the end of their rope. And Gottman was the first person that I had heard who really conveyed a message that his work was around helping those people. And not long after that, I went to an externship with Sue Johnson about um, uh, emotionally focused couples therapy. And I was lucky because uh, Sue was the presenter. Now she has a lot of people doing it. And um, I was able to get her for four days. And she was awesome. And, um, I, you know, she is, she's, she's, smart as hell and she's she's got a very positive personality huge heart great compassion super energy and um and when i was done with that training i realized that she had her she had her finger on how it's done she she really had a sense of how you can take people who are struggling and in pain and really help them um deepen their relationship reconnect not as i say in the book not sit there and just you know hold their noses so they can stay together because that was what they promised when they were married and it's inconvenient or frightening to get divorced so they stay together this is a way of people really connecting and reestablishing what she talks about as a deep attachment bond and so um and i also believe like bill doherty has said that um, a lot of people do couples therapy that um, really aren't trained to work with couples and they're individual therapists who end up working with couples and I think that that is one of the reasons why couples therapy is um, is acknowledged to be the least successful form of therapy and um, so I thought it was important to talk about that element too that 
that there are ways of thinking about working with a couple um, as an entity. For example, I, I don't see people individually. Um, I will at the beginning briefly just to connect with each of them, but I do not in the course of my work see people individually. I just don't think that that's, you know, that is consistent with an idea of working with the couple uh, as an entity. And, uh, you know, those sorts of ideas. So uh, first it was how hard divorce is, and then I wanted to talk about my second passion, which was, um, you know, uh, marital therapy that can truly work and be touching and moving. And that is really the focus of much of my current clinical practice. And then the last thing was, um, to, which turned out to be really a long desire of mine, um, was to help people understand what collaborative divorce is. Because the story of collaborative divorce is an incredible story. It's been around for 25 years. It's amazing that people still do not really know what it is or understand what it is or how it differs from the conventional approach. And um, that was the third thing I really wanted to uh, accomplish in this book. So it was just sort of, it, so I thought about it about, you know, a month after I finally had it done. And I realized in a way, it's sort of a love letter to the work I've done over the years. <laughs> that's a pretty long-winded response to a simple question, but that's sort of it. No, I like it. I have so many questions based on what you were just saying. I'm guessing the, the listeners might be wanting a quick synopsis of collaborative divorce. Collaborative divorce. Well, um, lawyers started to become trained in figuring out how they can help people communicate with each other when they're under stress and how they can not be so adversarial. And it was a huge paradigm shift for lawyers and it was tough. But one of the things they began to realize was that lawyers can't do it alone. And they had to create a much more supportive, what we call container for these people going through the process. So first they brought on a mental health professional as a coach. Some places in the country have a mental health professional for each person. There's two coaches. Um, we don't do that here in Washington because we concluded you know, 15 years ago when collaborative law came to Washington that a trained um, couples therapist can hold both people and uh, make a safe environment for both people. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's more uh, um, uh, cost friendly for people. And then there was uh, additional movement to bring in a financial specialist who could really help people figure out what they had, what their budgets were, because knowing your budget is super important to have a, a divorce. Divorce is so full of fear and anxiety about the unknown. And one of those unknowns is, what are things going to cost? And how am I going to live? And what's going to happen to me? Um, financial person really helps people figure that stuff out and communicate with them in a, a very positive way. And they're, and they're a neutral. They don't side with anybody. They work with both people together because the idea is, is that there is a goal that they are working at that will like those people have a problem, have a problem, which is how are they going to disconnect and proceed with their lives? So they're okay. And, um, the, uh, the financial person helps them come together and jointly look at that problem. And finally, there was a there was a person they brought on for children as a child specialist who is often called the voice of the child in the process. And um, that person would talk to the kids and get a sense of what's going on for them. You know, people who are now, you know, 20s and 30s and their parents got divorced, one of the complaints you hear a lot and have for a long time is, my parents didn't talk to me about what was going to go on. They were, you know, they made their decision about where I was going to live and what was going to happen. They never talked to me. And while kids can't really have a, uh, a final conclusive say about what the final residential situation is going to be, um, it was just, you know, it was just dropped on them without any input f from them. And so the child specialist talks to the kids, helps them understand a little more about what this process is and, and, and makes it a little safer for them. 
And so there was a team that coalesced around this couple. It ended up being a process that allowed people to go through a divorce which is as horrible as what you described at the very beginning with the trauma i mean you know divorce is a, is a huge attachment injury for people and so with that trauma that they have it allowed people to essentially be held by a trained and and compassionate professional team as they move through this process um the idea has just grown and spread. Now, um, the other thing to be aware of, which is important, is that collaborative divorce is not cheap. It's less expensive than the conventional approach, almost always, but not so much less expensive that people should choose to do it for, um, for financial reasons. But I can guarantee you, I can pretty close to, yeah, whenever I use that word, I have to, you know, I put my lawyer hat on and I go, well, can I really do that? Yeah, I'll do that. I'm pretty close to guaranteeing you that if people had the choice between going through a conventional divorce and going through a collaborative divorce process and they spent pretty much the same amount of money that the outcome and their satisfaction and most importantly their ability to be able to be in each other's lives afterward which is particularly important when they have kids is really going to be enhanced to an enormous degree right and just to clarify here so in the regular what you're calling adversarial divorce style each partner each marital partner lawyers up and they hire a lawyer that advocates for them, that fights for them, that essentially tries to make a case that their client is more deserving of both children and money and the other partner is undeserving of children and money. And uh, each lawyer will hire their own child specialist and their own uh, experts to uh, fight against the other side. And, right. And in collaborative divorce, aside from the lawyers, you have one professional that is for both people. You have one child specialist for both parents. You right. have one financial advisor for both parents. Each person gets a lawyer, but the agreement is, is that the lawyers will work collaboratively. They will work together and they probably follow a number of other principles like, well, if we start going down a road of conflict, let's see what we can do to, to smooth things out and help them to understand like, well, we're heading down a road that might get a little adversarial, so let's try to bring it back here. And, you know, what can each side give to the other side? And that kind of talk instead of the traditional adversarial approach where you're basically hiring a lawyer to fight for you and that's what they're ethically supposed to do, right? Right. And when you have two ethical mandates to fight the other person, then you have this, this uh, result where uh, by the end of the divorce process, if it ever ends, and sometimes it never ends, the partners hate each other. You know, things like, uh, well, she filed a motion that I'm a terrible parent because I had a drink on Thanksgiving night. And so I'm going to file a, a motion that she's a terrible parent because she works too much. And that's very hurtful to each other. You know, where you started out hurt by the fact that you're going to get a divorce and now you're heading into just drumming up horrible things that you could maybe say about the other person. And, and that's what the lawyers are supposed to do, right? That's what, that's their ethical responsibility, right? Well, right. And the, um, most lawyers who do this kind of work are really good people and they really strive to not stir the waters, not say things that are really, you know, overly damaging and to be mean. And a lot of times their stuff that goes into their papers that go to court and that are public record don't accuse the other person of horrible behavior that is, you know, humiliating and shaming on the record, but they still, if, if I'm going to court and trying to get, you know, 
time with my kid in a divorce and I have to persuade someone that doesn't know me or my wife that I should you know, get certain things, I'm going to have to present evidence that supports that. And almost always that evidence, even if it is as benign as it can be, is going to be something that's just going to make the other person's stomach tie up in knots and make them want to throw up because it's just, it's, it's, you're going to be saying things about each other that are at best just questioning. Right. And so in collaborative divorce, you go in the opposite direction where right. you really avoid that. All the professionals try to avoid that kind of mudslinging. You said something, actually, I wanted to comment on really quickly. You said that um, in a collaborative process, you know, if you're going down the wrong, you know, like an adversarial path, the lawyers and other people say, well, maybe you can give a little here and you can give a little there. And it's, that's not quite the way that process works, actually. What it, what it, the better way of describing it, I think, is that we really strive to understand what people's needs and interests are, what their concerns are, what they're worried about. People are worried in divorce. They're worried about whether they'll have enough money. They're worried whether they're going to have enough time with their children or whether they'll lose that contact. They're just, they're worried whether they can afford to do certain things that they thought they would be able to do for their kids. And so uh, when people get, uh, cranky with each other and they get their backs up and things start looking difficult and it sounds like they are moving into perhaps a certain deadlock, one of the things that is helpful is to really explore with them what's underneath their current you know, position. Right. And so in adversarial divorce, it's all talk about positions. Right. Whereas in collaborative divorce... It's focusing on people's worries right, and concerns. Right. Or and mediation. Mediation also does that, and that's yeah. important. Yeah. Okay. And are you saying that's different than, than adversarial? Mediation is, is, is quite different from adversarial, right. yes. Right. And so, and is it closer to collaborative divorce mediation? Absolutely. Okay. And so the therapist that is employed, the collaborative divorce therapist. The coach, the yeah. coach, they talk with each partner about those concerns. They help them be able to identify and articulate those concerns. And they also help people. The people who work as coaches in this community have different ways of, of doing their work. Yeah. Uh, a couple of them who are excellent, do a lot of uh, psychoeducation and talk a lot about how, you know, your role as spouses is coming to, has come to an end. And yet your role as parents will never end. And so you have to shed one identity, but hold on to the other and not let them contaminate each other. So your anger at the other person as a failed spouse um, has to be set aside because you are now dealing with them not as that, but as another parent. Yeah, I can imagine a situation, well, I can't only imagine, I, I've seen it many, many times as a, as a therapist, where a couple enters into a divorce, they have children, and say the father is worried that he's going to get screwed on the custody and he's not going to see his kids very often and he's going to, as you say, lose that relationship. He's going he's gonna to be a Disneyland dad and he's going to lose that intimacy, that daily, int he's obviously going to lose daily in intimacy, but he's really worried he's going to miss uh, the majority of the intimacy with his children. And so as his anxiety goes up, uh, without collaborative divorce, without sort of guidance and, and help in that way, he's going to start looking for ways to hammer the mom on her parenting, on her issues to try to win the argument that she shouldn't be given custody at all, even though he knows that she'll get some custody, but he's going to like really hit below the belt potentially to, to, to alleviate his worry that he's not going to get any time with his, with his children. Whereas in collaborative divorce, if you saw uh, him starting to do that, him starting to mudsling, you would say, okay, well, why, where's this coming from? What are you worried about? And he said, well, I, I guess I'm, I don't know what I'm worried about. And so you explore that. Well, I guess I'm worried that I'm going to lose connection with my kids. Oh, okay. So divorcing wife 
can we all agree that husband will be able to sustain that relationship with his kids? Can, can we all agree that both parents are going to sustain relationship with their kids? And we're going to definitely work on an agreement that will foster that. And wife says, well, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say no to that. So yeah. And then the father says, oh, okay, I don't have to mudsling anymore because I have that interaction or that that trust in the process one of the things that you say is that's so right on kirk is that um lots of times through mediation which is uh a, a very similar process to collaborative divorce when you have the two people who sit with a mediator and work through and talk through uh their concerns and the issues of the divorce uh it, it's um there aren't as many uh, professionals as involved in collaborative law. And if people can afford it, mediation is a, a great way to go. But one of the things that I've seen is over the years, I've worked with people, so many people, who are solid, good people who are so anxious and fearful during the divorce, but they work well together. They understand, you know, what's at stake and they all they need is a supportive place to come and get this job done that's such a challenging job for them and um i've had lots of times when we've gone through it and we've had a successful outcome and people feel sad but good that it's been done that i think oh man if these people had gone through the meat grinder of a conventional process they'd have hated each other. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this, I was so drawn to this work, was I'll remember forever this case I had, gosh, 15 years ago when I was practicing you know, conventional divorce. And the guy on the other side of the case was a great guy, a really, really excellent lawyer, wonderful man. I was extremely fond of him, and he was, you know, handled himself in a high level in, way with integrity. And we ended up settling the case after an all-day settlement conference affair where me and my client, the wife, were in one you know, conference room and the other lawyer and the husband were in another conference room and, the, um, and there, everything was involved, kids and money and the whole thing. And the, you know, the process, which they wrongly call mediation, um, it's really a settlement process in which you spend all day with that person going back and forth between these different offices to try to move people into settlement. And it's um, eventually, you know, people are very far apart and polarized at the beginning because they've really started at their most extreme positions. So they had a lot of room to move in negotiation. And by the time the day is over, it's about five o'clock and everyone is completely exhausted and really just wrecked. There's still, you know, certain areas where they're not in agreement. And those are often the areas where they feel the strongest. And the question to them is, well, do you want to, you know, throw it all in the trash can and, you know, go to trial and, you know, all the work we've done today and all the money you've spent, do you want to just waste it? Or do you want to just like, you know, split the difference on these things and just, you know, have an agreement? And that is sort of what happens. And that's what happened that day. And these two really good people with kids, I remember when it was over, my client hated her husband. She was so angry and hurt at him. And I heard from the other lawyer that the husband felt the same way about her. And I thought to myself, man, these people could have really done this and walked away in a good place. You know, they were good people. They're solid. They had issues that resulted in their divorce, but they could have been okay. And the process screwed them over. And collaborative law... You know, when it works, doesn't do that. And mediation, when it works, doesn't do that. Are the couple in the same room? Yes, they are. In collaborative law, they're always in the same room. Right, because it seems like that would really foster less negativity because the model you have it, it's like, you, you know, <laughs> do you watch Game of Thrones? Oh, yeah. Do you know when Tyrion had Bronn fight for him? You know, oh, yeah. You know when they have like, or the Viper fight for him? It's like right. you get send the mountain and the Viper into the r ring and they fight it out for you and one of them kills the other one and then you win instead of just bringing you know 
Tyrion and and whoever else he was fighting against into the room and like really let's let's you know let's be civil you know when you're in the room with someone you have to you have to try to be a little bit more polite you know or something and yeah although I would have dropped Tyrion through that hole in the floor <laughs> the moon door the, the moon door the moon yeah. door yeah tell me this because I want to know <laughs> I often in my experience because I'm not this is not my expertise. And I always say this to people as they're headed toward divorce um, and as a way of trying to dissuade them from going down the adversarial route. And I always recommend collaborative divorce and, and I show them the website, which is what again? Uh, in King County, it's uh, kingcountycollab.org. Okay. Yeah. Or they could Google collaborative divorce or something, right? Collab yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Collaborative law. Sure. There's sure. a a cabal of professionals that that it, that it are trained and agree to follow certain principles, right? Yes, a mystic cabal. Yeah. <laughs> and so, answer me this, um, because this is my experience that that I've found to be true is that there's generally a an algorithm or an equation that the typical nuclear family goes through with regards to asset division and parenting plan. You know, you, you take, you know, say the, the classic example is you got a man who earns a certain amount of money. He's had a career for a long time. You have the woman who her career has been off and on. She's worked part time. They have two kids. And the equation in my experience, nine times out of 10, the woman gets 60% of assets and she gets a certain amount of uh, maintenance for some kind of uh, mathematically derived. I am I wrong in, in that? My experience, Kirk, is that it's not quite as, for want of a better term, cookie cutter as that. It's interesting that that's actually been your experience on that. Because for me, there's been, there are so many different elements that play in. So typically, if you went to court, is sort of the benchmark, is that it would go to the woman and the father would have every other weekend or something with like a Wednesday here and there, correct? That, you know, that's still something that's done quite a bit. I mean, it's less, that's, that's the problem, man. You go to court and these people who are sitting on a bench who see thousands of these cases every year make decisions based in part on a very small amount of information that they get. And secondly, based on kind of their own experience and their own prejudices about the way things ought to go, as opposed to allowing people to sit down and talk about what's going on for them. The mom may resist having the dad have more time with the kids in part because she, that's been her role, her role you know, for the last many years and her identity and her sense of well-being are wrapped up into that. And you know, that's, that's reasonable. That's fine. That's her life. And, and that is a huge loss when the kids go over and spend time at the dad's. That's a huge loss for her. Um, that needs to be talked about. Now, that doesn't mean that it trumps every, you know, any other consideration at all. But to, to dismiss those concerns and to dismiss the concerns of a dad who said, you know, I worked really hard during the, during the marriage. Oh, that was our deal. And, um, and I didn't get that much time with the kids, but I really can adjust my life and I want to be much more deeply involved that is important and that's that's legitimate but if a guy wants to have more time with his kids i always want to know well you know what has been your past experience what have you done in the past what do you want to do now if a guy says well i work really hard and i want to have equal time and i will like some of my buddies i'll have a nanny for the kids and the mom's saying i really can attend to them better without that um you know, there's lots, lots of issues. That yeah, there's. well, sometimes I wonder, and this would, of course, never happen, if we as a society, as the law or something, just said, look, whenever you get divorced, you fill out this form and there's, a, there's an equation and it just figures it out for you. If uh, the end result would not be that too dissimilar from the vast majority of agreements that happen after $100,000 of money. That's true. Boy, that's a really, that's a great question. I mean, it really brings up a whole bunch of stuff. One thing it brings up is, you know, in the collaborative law community, we often have these discussions about, well, how, how often do you bring up, when do you bring up the law, if at all? And 
it's been a funny thing for you know, in the evolution of the process of these people who do this work that a lot of people have said for a long time, well, we don't want to really bring up the law because we want people to be able to talk about what they want to do and what is right for them. And we don't want to push them or coerce them in a particular direction just because that's what the law says. And of course, people who are going through the process get irritated at that rightfully so and i keep trying to tell my colleagues about this but it, like they get irritated because they want guidance they have no clue they don't really know how things lay out but the best agreement that people can make is an agreement that is informed by two things and one of them is it comes from an, an old great uh, article in a law review from Yale called The Shadow of the Law. It was about mediation. So the first thing is the shadow of the law. The law is a, kind of a general way that each state, because family law in different states is really different in many ways, right? And the law is the way each state expresses its, um, its values, about things and it's helpful to know what those values are for example in Washington as in many places if you receive something as an inheritance during the marriage that's considered all you know things being equal that's considered to be your separate property well that is an interesting uh, expression of uh, of values. What it says is that even though people are getting divorced and have a responsibility in many ways towards each other through the divorce, that it, it, in our culture in Washington and in most other states, our connection with our families of origin and what we get from our families of origin is highly valuable and needs to be acknowledged and needs to be honored. So if I get something during my marriage from my grandmother or from my one of my parents who dies, that's considered my separate property because it honors that. So, so the shadow of the law reflects values of the society and it's important to know what those are. The other value though that's equally important and which is disregarded in the conventional divorce process and and I think disregarded in this notion of having an algorithm of some sort in which you kind of can, can give people predictability about how these problems are solved is what I call the culture of the marriage. What did the people say to each other during the marriage? What did they say to each other as things started to fall apart? What did they want for themselves? What did they want for the other? Great story about uh, that this great collaborative lawyer in New York tells about how he worked with a guy who was getting divorced from a woman in New York, and the woman had lots and lots of her own family money. And it was not his, it was her separate money and he had really nothing he was a musician or something and they didn't really have anything that was community and they had two kids and they had talked to each other about how important it was for them to co-parent their kids because they loved their kids and they really respected each other as parents so they came to an agreement that she would buy him a co-op near her and it would allow them to co-parent their kids. She had plenty of money. It was like you know, no sweat off her brow to do that. She took the agreement to her lawyer to have it reviewed and, and get the advice. And her lawyer basically said, are you serious? No judge would ever make you do this. Don't do that. That's absolutely inconsistent with what the law is. She backed out of the deal. They ended up in nasty litigation. It cost a huge amount of money. And as you say, you know, the outcome was roughly around what it was going to be anyway, but after, after the family was essentially destroyed. And so it's important to acknowledge what people want for each other. There are lots of times where people want to have an agreement that is not consistent with what the law or what a judge would order, but that's okay. That's good. As long as they know. Essentially what feels fair to them right fair is a tough word i always i always feel well, what feels fair you know like yeah you know what 
you know, for instance, if you had a couple where the, again, using heterosexual couples, the, the woman decided to forego making money by becoming an artist or something. And to her, and they didn't have any kids. Now, if they went to court and they were married 20 years or something, she would get 60% or 50% of the stuff in general and maintenance. But uh, as this example, and I'm actually thinking of a couple that I know, the, the woman said, well, I didn't, I didn't make you earn a bunch of money for me. In fact, you supported me while I was an artist and we don't have any kids. And even if we did, we probably would have shared parenting in that way too. So even though the law would allows me to take at least half of your stuff and, and you're going to have to pay me, you know, for a number of years, I'm actually not going to do that to you because it doesn't make any sense. My school debt is mine and your school debt is yours and we'll just split our assets down the middle and you don't owe me anything and I don't owe you anything because that is what seems fair to them, even though it's not what would have been typically done in court. I love that example that sets off all these little bells in my head. Um, that could be fine. The questions that come up for me about that kind of an agreement and is number one, how much of it is, is that agreement motivated on either side, especially her side, because she seems to be giving up a lot that she would otherwise get legally. Um, how much of that is motivated by guilt? How much is that is motivated by the possibility that she had, she had involved with someone else? Or certainly if she was the one who said she was done with the marriage and withdrew, guilt is the strongest emotion that, that people who leave a marriage um, have. So how much is that a function, you know, a factor? Another thing I wonder about for her is, um, that's nice she says that, um, what is her plan? What's her life going to be like in five years? What's her life going to be like in 10 years? She has to think about those things. If they created, here's what I tell people a lot when they have difficulty, when they're like, a, like I've, just recently, I was mediating, and the woman said, "I really don't want to touch his his um, retirement, and because it's his, you know, they've been married for like ten, twelve years." And the question I, you know, that I had for her is, "What's going to happen to her when she gets to be retirement age? What's she going to do? She has to think about that." And the other thing is, you know, people get married; they don't have to get married. People can choose all manners to be in relationship. But when people get married, they create a community. And that's a, an affirmative, strong statement and decision they make. And I believe when people get married, when one person is amassing, you know, wealth through their, through their employment, that is an effort they're making for the community. And, um, you know, if, if, if the other person is not working that hard and, you know, and, and just taking advantage of it, and that is a problem for the person who's earning, well, then they have to say something about it and work on it. And if that is a big enough irritant, then they may have to terminate the relationship. But you create a community. And I think that to disregard that reality and say, well, it's just not fair that I take his money, is I think uh, only looking at a very small part of what is a much larger, more complex picture for them. Yeah, I agree. And also, I think it's important, because I've had similar conversations with women who are divorcing, exactly the same, actually, of her saying, well, it's his it's his retirement. And this is a couple that had been married for 30, 25 years or something. And I said, it's not his retirement. It's your collective retirement. Just because it's in his name, so to speak, does not mean that you don't, you haven't always owned half of it. It's always been even, you know, you know, but the culture of America, mainstream American culture, it's changing, but you know, it's still around in terms of patriarchy and males and sexism and, you know, males, it's, it's his car, it's his house, it's his job, it's his retirement. Have you ever run into that before where, where your sexist bells are ringing, where you're, you're thinking this woman has been beaten down by society to some, ex to some extent. And 
believes that she doesn't deserve much because she's a woman. And maybe as a you know, moral or ethical professional, I should point that out to her. Have you ever done something like that? Totally. I think that, uh, I think that people cannot make decisions that will impact them for so many years to come from uh, a place of distorted ideas about who they are or their rightness or wrongness or their shame or their guilt. And uh, that is why, without question, people who go through divorce almost always, but certainly who are burdened with those feelings, should really be working with a therapist to um, to un- unpack that stuff. You can't make these decisions from that standpoint. You just can't. So read us a passage from your from your book titled Divorce or Not a Guide by Joseph Schaub, which is available on Amazon. Gosh. How much does it cost, by the way? Uh, well, you know, so it's 17 it, USA. It says 17 USA, but it's, I think it's a little less on Amazon. You know how Amazon does that sort oh, yeah, of thing. Like probably like 13 or something. Yeah, yeah. That uh, is a very reasonable price. Do you well, set the price? You. Actually, you can. I uh, th- That was another part of that whole process that was fun. Uh, figuring out, I went online and I looked at all these books that were like mine and, you know, whether they were sort of my size and what people were charging for them. The interesting thing about the, this was self-published on uh, Amazon has a... Um, uh, has its own company called uh, CreateSpace. And um, I'll tell you, for all the um, negative publicity that Amazon has gotten about how they treat their employees over the last month or two, um, which I've had Amazon employees in my office uh, as clients, and um, and they do, they, they, they really, it's very tough. It's a very tough place to work in many ways. Their customer service is phenomenal. They, I, I was, it was a great experience for me. They were responsive, they were friendly, they were really informative, and they helped me every step of the way. I have nothing but, as a consumer of Amazon um, and CreateSpace, I have nothing but positive things to say about them. So it was really a great, it was really a, a, a great experience. The, the seven rules themselves are uh, lawyers are trained to make a bad situation worse, and judges do not dispense justice. Divorce comes at the best and worst time. Legal divorce is all about loss. Both people come away feeling they got screwed and their partner didn't. Legal divorce is expensive. And divorce lawyers and clients speak different languages, which, of course, can be a problem. So I just want to start out, just read the beginning of that this chapter. And uh, what I did uh, when I first wrote this book... Uh, I sent it to some good friends to kind of vet out, and uh, one of the responses I got from a lot of people was, who are you writing this for? Who's your audience? It seems kind of technical in a way. And I thought, okay, that's, that's really helpful information. And so I really changed the book around a lot, made it much easier for people. Uh, to, uh, it took a lot of the stuff that... Um, might have seemed technical, got it out of there, or put it in end notes. And the other thing I did is I created, um, I created two different couples that were going through uh, relationship distress. Right. And one of them, you kind of track them. Yeah, I track them throughout, and I start most chapters with something about them. And this one uh, starts with Beth, who is the person who had decided to divorce Adam. Uh, Beth and Adam and Kathy and Dennis. Yeah, yeah. Kathy and Dennis work it out. They're they're doing well. Um, we s- I saw them at dinner not long ago. Yeah. You know, looking at each other lovingly it was really nice. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, Beth and Adam, they're done. But here's how the seven cardinal rules chapter begins. It's Beth. Beth had been surprised by two things when she told Adam she wanted a divorce. One was his angry reaction. They had been disconnected for so long, and he seemed happy with every part of his life but her, but his sullen and resentful withdrawal felt like an ambush. Then to put the cherry on it, and totally befuddling her, she looked at the email on his computer one night and saw that he had a month-long string of affectionate 
um, flirty exchanges with Susie from the office. These combined to put Beth in a decidedly shaky emotional condition as she sat in the well-appointed waiting room of her lawyer. She liked Linda from what she read on her firm's website. Linda had practiced family law for 25 years and had her own practice after working for a prominent local firm for 10 years. She liked that Linda had a personal statement in her profile that said she loved to read on rainy winter days and hike local trails with her dog, and she was a person, a a, a patron of the local symphony. In the first conversation, it had been with Linda's assistant, Maggie. It had been pleasant, businesslike, and filled with detailed inquiries about finances and personal concerns. Beth was relieved to be welcomed by Maggie at the reception desk and to learn that she would be sitting in on the first meeting. After she got settled in the conference room and sipped the steaming dark roast coffee Maggie had brought her, Beth looked up when a door opened. An attractive woman in her early 50s with short cropped dark brown hair, wearing a stylish business suit and carrying a laptop and a glass of water, entered the room. Linda had a calm yet commanding presence and almost immediately Beth felt herself relax a bit. After asking if it was okay to take notes on a laptop, Linda raised the lid, fixed her reading glasses that had been hanging from a black lanyard around her collar, and got down to business. She went through the intake information given to Maggie, checking for needed corrections and augmentations. After about a half hour of rechecking and seeking additional personal and financial demographics, Linda closed her laptop, moved it aside, and looked directly at Beth. How are your kids doing? she asked. Beth was surprised and pleased by the question, as her children were her overriding concern. She told Linda that she was particularly worried about Adam Strange, quote, almost bipolar responses to her announcement that she wanted out of the marriage. She confided her worries that this Susie might be introduced into her children's lives and that she might even lose them to her. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what scares me, she said. Linda was reassuring and told her that no judge would refuse a request for an order keeping a new partner away from the children, at least while the divorce was proceeding. She told Beth what she might expect for custody, child support, and alimony. Linda had seen hundreds of divorces and had a good feel for how judges were ruling in the local courts. Beth Beth left Linda's office with a welcome sense of calm and confidence. This lasted for exactly 48 hours. That was when Beth received a call from Maggie, expressing her disappointment and informing her that Adam's lawyer had just sent a fax rejecting all of Linda's proposals for a temporary agreement. Could she come in sometime in the next day or two and help them begin to prepare papers for a court motion? Beth received an uh, an email with a number of attachments, one of which was a detailed budget sheet requiring her to figure out how much she spent every month. Another was a notice that Adam's lawyer was going to subpoena the records of her therapist, Loris. Why is he doing that? Beth asked Maggie in a panic. Well, replied Maggie, that's pretty much standard operating procedure when custody is at issue. What? yelped Beth. What do you mean, custody is at issue? What does that even mean? Does he want the kids? Don't worry, really, Beth. Adam is pressing for 50-50 custody, so you'll agree to lower alimony. It's a typical negotiation strategy. He won't get it. Anyway, we are going to ask for the court to appoint a custody evaluator who will definitely come out in your favor based on your history. Um, And I've got to ask you, is it possible for you to put another $5,000 in our trust account? Your initial deposit will be used up by the time the hearing on these temporary orders is over. Beth couldn't help herself. She got off the phone and called Adam at the office. What the fuck are you doing? She spit into the phone. What do you mean? Adam asked, taken aback. Beth told him what she had just learned, and Adam said that he just, that was just his lawyer, and he had nothing to do with it. He'd call his lawyer right away. Adam never called Beth back. There was no change f- from his lawyer. His communications became clipped and businesslike. When Beth read the statement that Adam had signed under oath and submitted to the court for their hearing for temporary orders, she was stunned and dismayed. He made comments about her possible mental instability and use of Zoloft for depression. He talked about how the economy was in transition. His income was going to be cut by 40%. 
Beth was happy the visa bill still went to her house because she saw that he had taken a week off last month to be in Hawaii. That certainly went in her papers. Through it all, Linda and Maggie were supportive and professional. The hearing was dreadful. Seeing Adam since stone face and not looking at her, any semblance of humanity or kindness erased, standing next to his lawyer was tough. Linda did a good job. His lawyer made Beth want to throw up. Half the things he said were lies. The judge made a ruling that took Beth's breath away. How was she going to manage on what Adam was going to pay her? She walked out of the courtroom confused by the result and hurt and furious at Adam. And that was the beginning of a nine-month slog. So that's just the beginning of their story. It's a, um, it's a, it's a happy story, but that's you know. But I think that's pretty reflective of. Yeah, of I would say that that it describes a very typical situation. If you're divorced out there and you went through anything similar to that, which I'm sure a lot of you have, my guess is is you're thinking, "Wow, Joe Schaub, you are an excellent writer, and you have a lot of experience with this sort of thing," because that is exactly what I went through. I was I was innocent. I didn't know about the law. My lawyer seemed to be very confident. We thought everything was going to go smoothly, and then I get this stuff from my my you know ex spouse and the lawyer throws me for a loop, and we go to court, and it was traumatic for me, and the judge was completely unreasonable, and as your one of your rules is that. Both people come away feeling they got screwed and their partner didn't. Of course, Adam probably feels the same way. Totally. Absolutely. <laughs> just par for the course. Just the status quo of divorce in America. So let me, is it okay if I just do another quick one? Um, let me read this little bit about uh, rule number two. Judges do not dispense justice. Um, back in the 1980s, there was this widely respected and accomplished family lawyer from Sausalito, California, named Stephen Adams. He was considered by many to be the expert in California divorce law. This is a real person? Real, this, is a, this is real, real stuff. Annually, he would go around the state and lecture in hotel ballrooms packed with family lawyers reviewing the past year's developments. I came away from my first such conference with two distinct impressions. One, there were a lot of family lawyers who were committed to being at the top of their craft. Two, the guy was absolutely brilliant. Adams told this story about his days in practice. Clients would often arrive for their first meeting with him filled with righteousness. They felt wronged, and they wanted justice. Adams suggested to these people that they ought to go down to the courthouse and sit in on the morning's worth of family law hearings. He told them it would help orient them, and when he had to take them into court soon, they'd be more comfortable with the proceedings. What he didn't tell them was that he also wanted them to see how courts operated. He wanted them to observe judges slashing, burning, and pillaging the cases before them. He wanted his clients to see the reactions of litigants after a judge's ruling. After the experience, he would nail them with the message, forget your day in court. The days of judges having the chance to contemplate the cause before them and render Solomonic justice are long gone if they ever existed in the first place. Judges are overworked deciders. With the explosion of lawyers over the past decades has come the accompanying huge increase in legal cases. The no-fault divorce revolution of the 1970s put further pressure on family law judges' calendars. The men and women in robes hear thousands of requests for temporary orders in divorce cases each year. Managing a caseload becomes a valued skill. Judges are administrators as much as contemplators, perhaps even more so. Divorce amplifies this problem because of the volume of people who come before the court not represented by lawyers. A lot more people get divorced than have auto accidents or bring other kinds of lawsuits. Getting divorced doesn't mean you have money. In fact, one reason people get divorced is financial stress. Many thousands of, it, of couples get divorced in this country every year who can't afford lawyers. This doesn't mean they know how to navigate the court system, though. Hardly any non-lawyers know what forms to use, what court deadlines are, or what can constitutes the kind of proof that deciders sitting on their benches need to order to come down on one side or the other. Legal proceedings are technical, and many is the poor soul who has gotten lost in the maze. 
judges and court commissioners spend countless hours explaining things to unrepresented citizens. With the already high caseloads, this allows even less time to devote to individual matters. How do judges cope? Well, for one thing, when you see the same kind of problems and arguments over and over, day after day, for months and years, you cannot help but develop your own shorthand. Cases begin to fit into certain boxes in your head. Judges are human beings, and attempts to train bias out of their brains is a daunting task. Try as they might, judges who are careful to guard against the most obvious biases cannot escape their own life experience. As noted by one New Mexico family law judge, too few judges and lawyers have examined their personal beliefs, attitudes, and expectations about family matters in any depth, and that leaves them vulnerable to becoming emotionally entangled in divorce and custody cases, sometimes quite unconsciously. What does reach their conscious awareness is that they are extremely uncomfortable, but they haven't the skills to reflect on their discomfort through introspection. In short, family law has a propensity to diminish objectivity and blur boundaries for judges and lawyers and thus cause emotional overload. Excellent examples of bias based on personal experience can be found as high as the country's Supreme Court. Take Justice Antonin Scalia, for example. Scalia, a devout Catholic was born in 1937. His generation and, per and personal background were certainly not conducive to appreciating any benefits to be had from mental health counseling. I think it is safe to say that Justice Scalia never sat across from a therapist when he was troubled, since he is gleefully unabashed in expressing his beliefs, it is not surprising that his own bias leaked out in an opinion he wrote in a 1996 about therapy. The question was whether there was a therapist-patient privilege which prevented a social worker from having to testify in federal court about a client's disclosures to her in their sessions. The court's opinion said that such protection did exist, but Scalia dissented, saying no such privilege should apply in federal courts, despite the fact that every state had such protections in their own courts. In revealing passage, Justice Scalia noted, when is it, one must wonder, that the psychotherapist came to play such an indispensable role in the maintenance of the citizenry's mental health? For most of history, men and women have worked out their difficulties by talking to, among others, parents, siblings, best friends, and bartenders, none of whom was awarded a privilege against testifying in court. Ask the average citizen, would your mental health be more significantly impaired by preventing you from seeing a psychotherapist or by preventing you from getting advice from your mom? I have little doubt that the answer would be, yet there is no mother-child privilege. And so I say, yes, I know what you're thinking. Why isn't there a bartender-customer privilege? That is a discussion for another day. Seriously, though, it is hard to read the above passage and not be struck by Antonin Scalia's, one, unfamiliarity with the counseling relationship and its value, and two, his resultant bias. Yeah, I. it took me a long time to realize this, and it really came home to me when I had a really long talk with a judge, a friend of mine, actually. <laughs> And we, we had a long, long talk about judge bias and about how they don't get trained on how to understand things, you know, how, you know, they'll, they'll see cases, for instance, on mental health and this sort of thing. And she was telling me that they don't get trained very much and they want more training. They're human beings. And they only have so much time to listen, as you say, to the facts. And they got more cases, you know, that are beaten down the door. And they're only human. And they only have so many, so much time and so much brain power and so much wisdom to, to understand what to do. And so they end up looking for quick shortcuts to get to the end. Or they're looking for, you know, well, what's typically done in this situation rather than thinking what's right or, you know, what's best. And, and that's a big question, right? Like what's best for society and what's best for these people and what's best for these children. And, you know, that's, a, I think, what a, a point that you were saying earlier, which is, you know, let's keep it out of the courts in general because the, the court 
isn't an appropriate place to figure out what's best for a family and what's best for parenting and what's best for children. That that should be a much more deep conversation that you have with a number of professionals that are looking at all the details and that are trying to help people negotiate those sorts of things. One of the things I think that is said oftentimes is that if you're bringing your case in front of a judge who's going to make this decision, I mean, there will be a... Um, an evaluation by somebody who's usually a mental health professional that will be pretty lengthy and expensive and all, and they'll make the decision. But none of these people know you and your kids as well as you do. And you're the ones that should be making these decisions. Right. And this is, again, my opinion. And you're, are you still practicing law? Nah. Okay, so you don't have to. I do mediation, with, but I don't do law anymore. So you don't have to deal with judges anymore, you know, professionally speaking. And I don't either. Uh, really, uh, I've experienced some horrendous judges that in family law, this one judge turns to me and I was just providing testimony and I didn't really care which way the situation went. I was called in by DSH just, just to provide information. And so I wasn't invested in anything. And the one of the parents was having a problem with what I was saying. And so they said, well, you know, judge, he has been meeting uh, at times individually with our son, our teenage son. And so, you know, I don't think he's practicing real family therapy. And just for the record, I've been teaching and practicing family therapy for, you know, 17 years. I've been I, as you can see, Joe, on my wall are literally thousands of books, many of which are, there's another bookshelf over there <laughs> of many. Uh, I will confirm th- that. Yeah. And as a marriage family therapist yourself, you can attest that it's standard practice for many family therapists to occasionally meet individually, particularly with a teenage boy, you know, if he's especially, if, especially if he's not talking very much in front of his parents. And so the, you know, the, the mother can say that, you know, she's, she can, you know, say whatever she wants, but the judge turns to me and says, sir, you are an unethical therapist. You are providing uh, unethical treatment. You call yourself a family therapist? No. Yes. And I looked at her and I, and I, there, I was seething on the inside because, because I was teaching family therapy at the time. I'm like, who the F are you to, I mean, you can ask me my expert opinion and you could start quibbling with me about that, but just without any question in your mind, you just turn to me and tell me that. And I thought, what can I do to that? Like, she's all powerful. Where, where do you complain about a judge? What, do I stand up and s- start arguing with her? Can I go to her boss and complain about her? Like, what recourse do you have? And so when you give seemingly, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure I am wrong, seemingly absolute power to someone, I think there are abuses. And, and I've, I don't know what response I'm looking to from you, but I'm just saying judges are human. And so if you're going to turn to these human individuals with extremely limited time and varying biases, as you were pointing out, re- reading from your book, uh, written so well, then you're really rolling the dice. And so it really points to, let's try to keep this well away from the court because uh, so often families leave court, everyone feeling terrible. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, lawyers who do the conventional job will almost always tell their clients as they're approaching trial, this is a risk. You don't know how the court's going to respond to things. Well, let's get back to your book, just just in closing here. Um, again, it's called Divorce or Not, A Guide by Joseph Schaub, who's a family therapist and an attorney. And just to highlight the different sections here, because I don't think we've really highlighted the different sections, uh, you, you make it very readable and understandable by providing these two couples that go through the process. The first part of your book is about salvaging a marriage. Right. It's so, so it's like this is, you know, perhaps the first question that all couples enter into when they're headed towards divorce. It's, it's like how can, you know, is it possible for us to salvage this? And this is these are the couples that come into our office. Right. You know, one foot's out the door, or both feet are out the door, but well, I might as well go to marital therapy, maybe they'll wave a magic wand and <laughs> and sometimes that's absolutely possible. Um because we're awesome therapists and we have magic wands. And we have magic wands. That's right. And so you have a, a number, a few chapters here just talking about uh, how to salvage a marriage, how to come back from the brink. Right. 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 And then you, you talk about how uh, to make the decision about whether or not 
to divorce. You, you right. have some guidance on that. And again, this is all a guide for couples right. on, on that. So a guide to salvaging the marriage and a guide to making the decision. And then you have this guide to actually divorcing, you know, right. what that should look like. You have the seven cardinal rules. You have the psychology of divorce. You have a chapter on if you can't avoid divorce, you should do it right. And you have a chapter on how to help the children through divorce. And uh, uh, talking about mediation and collaborative law and this sort of thing. And so I want everyone to know that it's the, it's the most comprehensive all-around book about, uh, about divorce and, and how to do it right and, how, and all the different factors that go in. Because uh, most people, they just, as, as your you know, vignette describes, they get a lawyer and that's it, you know? Right. And that lawyer isn't paid necessarily to explain all these things. They certainly don't have time. And so a book like this can can really help people go through all of those different stages. Well, I got to tell you, Kurt, I, I really want to thank you for your kindness and talk, the way you talk about the book and the way you summarized it. Um, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative. And I think you really did a good job in kind of reflecting what I was trying to, to get get to. Well, uh, any final word on divorce? Any what's your what's your Jerry Springer at the end of the show speech? Oh man, Jerry Springer, like you know, <laughs> don't go on Jerry Springer if you're getting divorced. <laughs> but I'd say um, I'd say that that divorce that that intimate conflict is about the most painful thing we can go through in our lives, short of having our children suffering and. Um, and the greatest pain we'll go through and the greatest challenge we'll have is in our intimate conflict. And uh, just because it hurts and just because it's painful doesn't mean that we cannot heal those those wounds and and strengthen that bond because that bond is the most important bond we have in our adult lives. And, um, and it reflects the incredible need we had as, as infants for an attachment bond and it exists in our adult lives. And um, it's a it's a, it's a it's a beautiful and worthy goal to try to um, to heal that. But not all relationships, not all marriages that are in pain can be healed. And there are those that will end. And um, I think it's very important to always keep in mind that if a person chooses to end their marriage, um, it's usually almost always not the fact that they chose to end it that is a basis for looking at them and perhaps judging them. People, good people make a decision to end a marriage all the time, but it's how they do it. And um, whether you can go through this extremely challenging transition in your life with integrity and uh, the expectations and the opportunities that exist with both mediation and with collaborative law um, to go through this process with integrity and to emerge from it feeling uh, as strong as you can given the challenges and certainly much more able to see your new path and to embark on the next chapter of your life is really an incredibly important thing to be able to do. And uh, for anybody who's listening to this, who's going through any of those struggles, um, I just uh, wish you strength. And, um, and I also wish you uh, the support of really uh, good, good people who are, you know, find it as their calling to support you. Yeah, the one thing that I always think about when any couple is breaking up, whether it's divorce or just breaking up, is how can we do this in a way that in the end you're basically friendly? You don't have to be friends, and maybe you're friends, but at one time you were in love with each other, and so why can't that be? Why can't that relationship ten years later be looked back on with some fondness? And I think a major component to that is the ability after the point of like okay, let's break up. From that point forward. How do you manage 
the relationship after that point. Because in our culture, we tend to say clean break. It's like, I've told her I want a divorce and that's it. I never have to talk to her again. I'm only speaking through the lawyers and I'm only going to do it over email and that's it. And a lot of people will say that. They'll be like, you don't have to talk to her. You don't owe her anything. And what I do a lot with couples is they go, because a lot of people come to, come to therapy to divorce. Uh, not many, but some do. And right. what, I, right. what I really focus on is forgiveness and of asking for forgiveness, asking and asking for apologies and giving apologies. You know, if you fell out of love with someone, it's not your fault that you fell out of love with them, but you can say that you're sorry and you can mean it and you can say you're sorry, you know, 20 times over the span of a, of a year. It doesn't cost you anything. And as the person receiving the apology, you can say, thank you so much for apologizing. That's really all I wanted to hear was that you care about me and that you're sorry. And just that alone can set people on the right path. Whereas so many other people, they break up, it's t- terrible. And then you look back on this relationship and you think, why was I ever even with that person? That person was a terrible human being. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with love? What's wrong with people these days? I could probably never trust another person again for the rest of my life because look, look what happened there when it could be a whole different narrative. <laughs> and so, I don't know, I'm, I'm ranting, but... Uh, it's a good rant, though. It's a good rant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me, Joe. Thank you, Kirk. Again, you can find it on Amazon for probably less than $17 called Divorce or Not, A Guide by Joseph Schaub. 300 pages of great stuff. Highly recommend it. Easy to read. A guide to divorce all the way around. And people out there, take care of yourself because you deserve it.